Recording live from the Hoban Law Group here in Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Eric Singular. We're sitting alongside president and founder of the Hoban Law Group, Bob Hoban. And Bob, it's been a little while since uh, we've been here together, just in a a one-on-one fashion, and uh, we've both been up to a lot of things. So before we dive into all of the different developments that have occurred over the last few weeks, uh, let's touch base real fast over just what we've been doing. I know you went on a backpacking trip. That's a great thing to do in the days of COVID to get socially distanced and isolated out in the beautiful wilderness here in Colorado. So uh, tell us what you can about uh, what you've been up to over the past couple of weeks. Well, uh, talk about uh, the beautiful um, landscape in Colorado. This indeed was that uh, uh, we went um, as, a, uh, as a group um, for uh, folks in, that uh, I, I'm friends with, it was Charles Feldman, it was uh, Derek, it was uh, Stan, and it was it was Chris Peruzzi, and we had a good old time out in the uh, Mount Evans Wilderness area, and it's really really close to Denver. In fact, it's just a few short miles out of downtown Evergreen, Colorado, where I reside, and. When you start to drive down Upper Bear Creek Road and you get past these ho- homes, uh, by the way, Willie Nelson's old homestead is along that road. Um, uh, but uh, once you get past the, the, the uh, developed areas, it starts to open up. And it's really only open from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day, this particular road to access what's called Camp Rock. So you're back in the Mount Evans Wilderness area and you're uh, out, out accessing these trails with plenty of water and wildlife. We saw moose, we saw bear, we saw or bears, I suppose, not, and uh, plenty of deer and uh, not deers, though. And uh, we had a great time. At the end of the day, uh, it is good to get out into Colorado, but that little watershed there, that little valley, that little little meadow is just one of the most spectacular places in all of Colorado, and nobody goes there Nobody knows about it, and it doesn't you know, help that it's limited for access for uh, the summer months only. And I'm not going to steal his glory, but uh, Mr. Feldman shared a story about some lightning and thunder a little while ago with us on that uh, that happened during that trip that was just pretty awesome. And uh, I know you went when uh, a lot of the state was on fire, and it's an interesting thing. There maybe is a theme to this little one-on-one episode uh, that – Fire in Colorado, especially in the summer, is a, is a big topic. It's a, uh, something that we deal with often. And there is this concept of while fire is very destructive, it also is how things are reborn. And a lot of things have happened in the cannabis industry over the last couple of weeks that uh, they've gotten people up in arms. It's almost like a fire erupting in the industry. It mobilizes people. It makes people uh, – you really see the passion come out for the cannabis plant and for this industry when you see forces that maybe try to shut down different elements of the industry. And I'm talking, of course, about the interim final rule we saw come out from the DEA. And uh, for those of us out there who don't really know how to decipher these things, who maybe don't sit down and read all of the pages that are published in the Federal Register, give me a sense and give us a sense, Bob, of What does this mean? Is this the DEA really coming into the hemp industry and shutting down the cannabinoid sector as it maybe has been received by some folks? Or how do we uh, how do we interpret what the DEA has said in the last few weeks? Well, uh, you you talk about a fire and and this certainly uh, has lit one within the industry. Um, But uh, there was no fire on the mountain, I can assure you. In fact, uh, when I was up there in the Mount Evans wilderness area, just to put a bow on that, uh, we did get rain for a couple hours every afternoon, which was typically common. But to your point, it's just been so darn dry, uh, and and we've had those wildfires in Colorado. But switching gears here and looking at it, the uh, the DEA has has, uh, issued an IFR, an interim final rule, as it relates to uh, derivatives, effectively, of uh, industrial hemp. And uh, there's two points that have really seemed to uh, uh, attract the interest of the industry, uh, the dedicated interest, and that is the idea that at no point can any derivatives or materials that come from 
the cultivated industrial hemp plant exceed 0.3% THC by dry weight. And that's what the, the law says. Uh, so that one would seem to uh, have a bearing on those folks that, um, that process, that manufacture, that extract, because necessarily throughout that process, you do exceed that threshold, even though the products do not uh, go out the door um, pursuant to you know, many state rules, including Colorado's, above 0.3% THC. But we got to focus on that dry weight standard, number one. Number two, uh, it's this concept of Delta-8 THC, or the idea that there are compounds within the industrial hemp plant which if uh, manipulated, if you will, uh, that's a lawyerly way of, of trying to describe a scientific process, uh, would create some sort of psychoactive effect or psychotropic effect, um, and it comes from, from hemp, then that too is a scheduled or controlled substance. Uh, so that has uh, riled and agitated the industry for sure, and uh, we will uh, see how that ultimately does play out. Well, there's so much to dig into on that point, and, and uh, I know that when we originally talked about this, right in the aftermath of this thing coming out, you said that it, it it's part of a pattern that we've seen for a long time. Obviously, the Hoban Law Group has been involved with uh, different lawsuits against the DEA in the past because... We've seen the DEA try to maybe overstep its bounds time and time again. They still want a seat at the table when it comes to industrial hemp. And there are a lot of folks in this industry who look back at the 14 Farm Bill, look back at all the progress we made with hemp in the United States, and they say, why is the DEA so involved? And I, I think about it when the USDA interim final rule came out and they said, why are you making this requirement about DEA labs when there aren't even enough DEA labs to sample all the material that's being grown right now? And there's anecdote after anecdote after anecdote, especially as we approach harvest here in 2020, where folks who had no intention of growing anything that even resembled marijuana have product or cr a crop in the field that needs to come off the field, but a lab test was maybe a little inaccurate, maybe the lab that was sampling that material wasn't totally accurate, and they're sitting there hands tied. So I, I know you originally said, man, we've seen this kind of thing before, and if you could just speak a little bit to that, isn't it time to make the DEA say, hey, it's hemp, there's a line in the sand here legally, and we really don't need you overly involved? Well, certainly that appears to be what was written into the 2018 Farm Bill. It appeared to be uh, direct language um, written and enacted by Congress that severed ties between the DEA and the industrial hemp part of the cannabis plant and delegated that authority to the FDA and to the USDA. Of course, with DEA um, jurisdiction, should there be an abuse or there be, uh, you know, uh, hot material, so to speak, quote-unquote hot, meaning above 0.3% THC. So that is ultimately what um, what the legislation does say. But I think it's more indicative, Eric, of a historical battle between the DEA and Congress, which is an interesting perspective. And it is a perspective that in 2017, when we had an oral argument in the Ninth Circuit in the HIA versus DEA 3 case, um, uh, a great attorney in Washington, D.C. named Adrian Sneed was able to uh, help facilitate an amicus brief of uh, multiple uh, sitting members of Congress that detailed in painstaking uh, language uh, and detail that the DEA and Congress have always butted heads. And it's been this back and forth and back and forth, whether that's spending or legislation or a little nip and a tuck in the regulations or the Controlled Substances Act. And that is, I think, what underlies a lot of this. Uh, and we'll see where political leadership can come out on this issue because I think that's really where this needs to go. Well, and, and that brings us kind of to the next point here, which is that – there's been another headline that I've seen a little bit here over the last couple of weeks, and I, I definitely wanted to bring into our conversation today, which is that the House is voting on some kind of legislation regarding cannabis. I don't know if it's decriminal decriminalization, if it's 
full on legalization, if it's some iteration of the Moore Act or the States Act or something like that. But you have right now, and it's unlikely that this is going to happen before the November election, you have people at the highest level of government at the, uh, the Congress level already looking at the possibility of legalized marijuana or some variation thereof. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've heard or what you've seen as it relates to that impending uh, vote in the House? Well, certainly um, there is support in the House of Representatives at the, in the United States to, uh, to, to, to modify the Controlled Substances Act and to modify U.S. cannabis policy and or cannabis banking. But the question becomes the Senate, which is controlled by the Republicans, but it also become, becomes a, an issue of implementation. Eric, just like we're talking about with the implementation from 2014 of hemp legislation that required agencies to begin acting to anticipate both at the state and federal level, this exact thing would require that same sort of movement and activity um, if that were to occur. And the states are far more swift at advancing cannabis policy, as we've seen. And there's three states, I believe, that have it on the ballot this year um, and that the polls appear to be in that favor, although I think we would all can see that polls are uh, a tool but not definitive by any stretch of the imagination in this day and age. Um, and if you look at that direction that things are going, um, that could have an influence. And as we've talked about and as I've written about, I don't know if we need the federal government to sanction what's happening in this industry because I think the states do it best, but the federal government simply uh, should look at a policy that would take services and allow for greater accountability and compliance along the lines of beginning with banking and tax reform. Those are the steps, I think, that the federal government needs to take as it relates to this plan. Although we've got an election coming up. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, and uh, anything, literally, anything could happen. Yeah, and, and I think we're all waiting with bated breath to see exactly what does happen, and I, I wanted to bring up this one thing. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. i got to share it with you if you haven't, but it's, uh, it's a Democratic candidate in the state of Kentucky who has run an ad against McConnell, uh, basically saying that he is not supported hemp uh, farmers in the way that maybe he was poised to at a certain time. And they reference, of course, uh, the failure of Jen Canna. They reference the uh, delay in FDA regulations as it relates to cannabinoid products and CBD products. And I just thought it was interesting because we're just living in an interesting time, man. And you, you decide this idea of fire that – the industry is just ignited right now. I went on a 2,700-mile road trip last week. It was pretty awesome. It was a hemp road trip. And to, uh, to meet all these people and interact with all these people who, they're just farmers, man. You know, we were up in, uh, up in the Dakotas. And these people are, they're doing everything the right way. And to put that in the backdrop of, federal regulators or policymakers who are still trying to figure out, oh, do we need the DEA involved? Is, it, is there a possibility that there are some bad actors out there? And yeah, maybe somewhere in the process it will cross that 0 0.3 threshold. But to actually interact and be face-to-face -face and in the field with these guys who are just, they couldn't be more excited about growing hemp and what this means for, for them and for a global industry, you have countries all around the world that see the value, not necessarily in cannabinoid oil, although they are more. You see uh, a global demand for hemp seed oil. You see the major cosmetic brands. We've talked about Colgate in the past. You see all the major players who are like, we're not going to jump into the cannabinoid space right now, but we're interested in hemp seed oil. And that's how we're going to get our foot in the door here with quote unquote cannabis because at the end of the day it is cannabis so it's just wild when you interact with these guys fourth generation farmers man and you got these arguments going on up here you got the guys who are growing acreage and acres on acres on acres down here and then it's just you got the hoban law group man and 
What do you do? What do you? How do you think about all of this, Bob? How do you put it all together? Well, it's a lot from from McConnell to uh, little <laughs> pink houses for you and me. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I, I I I appreciate that perspective and, and I admire that perspective, Eric. And that is something that we need to think about. It doesn't matter what the product is, particularly as we talk about the cannabis industry and as we talked about with some of our friends earlier. It comes down to the cultivators, right? The people that are going to begin the supply chain they're at the top if they're not producing consistent quality material um, then the supply chain the industry doesn't have a chance and to see that there are qualified farmers that are excited about this really does in fact you know make a difference and that's why i think you bet on industrial hemp so many times over because it will present something new and to your point exciting for the farmers they get to grow something different. They get to grow something with multiple possibilities so long as they don't um, you know, get sidetracked into just a single-purpose crop or a single-purpose focus. Now, what about Senator McConnell? Uh, at the end of the day, um, the man is the president of the, the Senate, <coughs> uh, the Republican majority leader in the Senate, and he has a lot of responsibility and a lot of things, and um, – he has been unequivocally a champion for the hemp industry, without question. Has he done enough? Can he truly influence the process right now when he's done his job as a legislator to creating legislation that paves the path for this? Can Are there things at his disposal? Certainly, but there's a lot going on in our country at this point in time, and I don't want to make excuses for the man, but at the end of the day, uh, I do believe that Senator McConnell's in the hemp industry's corner, and I do believe that he um, wants to see some changes made to put the industry on a better track to be, to your point, ag-focused and to be more grassroots, which will in, in turn create more of a stable within our ag economy. How do you get there? That's something that any of us would really, really have to think about from a policy perspective. You can't just have a knee-jerk reaction uh, like so many do in politics. So I'm not trying to uh, justify what some people perceive as inaction from Senator McConnell, but I am trying to explain that I certainly understand where we are today and, and feel like you know we do have a champion in the corner for this cause, uh, and it comes from strange places sometimes. On that note, because I think you're absolutely absolutely right, I want to talk for a moment uh, about civic engagement because we rely so much, uh, I think, just as a society here in the United States on people in positions of power to do the right thing. And I saw something on the wild world of uh, – the wild and wacky world of social media when this DEA thing happened that said, don't bother – public commenting on the DEA IFR because they're not going to listen to you anyway. And I think back to that public comment period uh, after the USDA interim final rules came out, and there were a number of folks who were disappointed. They were like, guys, you care about this. You do feel very passionate about this. And yet the number of people who actually took the time to submit public comments was fairly low when you look at how many people there are in the actual hemp industry. So I guess uh, to, to wrap this all up, Bob, give us your thoughts on there, there is some responsibility at the personal level. And do you really feel like it's uh, fruitless to submit public comment and to make your voice heard and to stand up and say, hey, guys, I have an opinion about this. I do exist in this industry. And hey, listen to what I have to say. I think it's the same thing of, of saying uh, I'm so dissatisfied with um – the choices, for example, to vote for as U.S. president in November that I'm not going to vote. Um, I think we have an obligation to vote. Whatever side you're on, I think you have an obligation to become as informed as you can, which varies by person, and make a, a decision. I think the same thing applies to public comment. But let's compare, compare public comment to the voting process. What you do in a voting booth or by mail constitutes one vote out of millions. It's important. In the aggregate, it's important because if you feel you're not going to do something and you don't do it, the chances are that there's you know, a large number of people feeling the exact same way. 
And if you become one of a larger percentage that decide to get up off your behind and go out and cast a vote, then I think you've done the right thing. But public comment, that's the opportunity. This is an American process that I think actually works. Now, you might say, well, I submit things and they don't listen to me. But if there are the, the FDA sincerely and the DEA sincerely want to know what this industry is all about. They want to know what this stuff is. They want to know why people use it. They want to know wh whether it's safe or whether it's not. These are things that people in the industry take for granted and think it's so obvious, but it's not a fact. And that doesn't mean that these organizations are just sort of kind, benevolent organizations. They have a job to do. And it's a very difficult job. And as they evaluate these things, I truly think that they want input from groups and people. Those, that input is categorized. It, it is, it is uh, recorded. It is separated and polished and presented to decision makers in terms of here's are the topics that were raised and here's the number of people that said this about that. So your, your, your voice in this context, if you care about this industry matters more than ever to submit public comment in this process, then even a vote for the President of the United States does because it has more direct impact. Um, even though, as I said, I think it's our obligation, I'd encourage everyone to go out and vote on November uh, 3rd. Be an active participant, man. Don't sit around saying all of this stuff just happens to us and happens to me and it's all rigged. Get out there, do something, say something. Chances are you might know more than the people who are making th these decisions, especially if you're in this industry and you live and breathe this stuff every day. It's not obvious. So without further ado, this is the Hoban Minute, guys. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Hoban Minute. Do you have any ideas for episode topics or guests? We would like to hear from you. Reach out to us at media at hoban.law and stay tuned for more on the Hoban Minute.